Whenever I begin writing a new story, I ask myself, where do I begin? And is this actually a good idea? For many creatives, the blank page is the most difficult hurdle to get over. We can come up with any number of excuses to not write that first scene or first idea. But why? In the words of Stephen Pressfield, There seems to be a force in the world that is is a negative force against anything that that we any dream that we would have the force pressfield is referring to is what he calls resistance he explains how every failed writing attempt is giving in to this force i don't feel like it resistance i don't have enough time resistance i'm not good enough it's resistance but what's the antidote it's showing up and putting in the work of writing every day, no matter what. Every professional writer knows this. Neil Gaiman says it best. He says, anything you write can be fixed, but you can't fix a blank page. But where do your ideas come from, Mr. Gaiman? What you've actually done there <laughs> is ask the question that must not be asked of writers. Okay, what about you, Steve? Where'd the idea for Bagger Vance come from? Um, Bagger Vance comes from, I ripped it off from the Bhagavad Gita, from the Vedic scripture. Um, Wait, doesn't that make Pressfield a plagiarist? One might think that, but I think it would be a hard sell. Even after admitting he ripped off the story from the Bhagavad Gita, one can hardly compare the story of a golfer and his caddy to that of a distressed warrior who calls upon a god to guide and deliver him. And yet, there is an aspect that is exactly the same. The caddy in Bagger Vance acts as a guide and mentor to the troubled golfer Juna. The same way Krishna acts as a guide to the troubled Arjuna. Juna, Arjuna, get it? <laughs> Never mind. So why is it that most of us wouldn't consider that plagiarism? Well, I think the answer to that lies in the big old sexy brains of Carl Jung and Joseph Camp. But before I go into detail, let me just rewind back to Pressfield for a second and mention where he really gets his ideas from. I mean, besides ripping them off old scriptures. The Muses. In his own words, he describes the Muses as the collective identity of nine goddesses, the daughters of Zeus and Nemesine, whose duty it is to inspire artists. He considers them a force, really, whose other names might be the unconscious, the self, the quantum soup. Regardless, what the force represents is the unseen dimension of potentiality that is either within us or maybe even beyond us. It's where ideas come from. And if you're interested in learning more about Pressfield's ideas about the muses and resistance, go pick up his book, The War of Art. Though this may all sound a bit airy-fairy and intangible, Carl Jung, the famed psychoanalyst and contemporary of Sigmund Freud, went into great detail to explore and shed light on this phenomenon. He called it the collective unconscious, a depth of our psyche that underpins even our subconscious where we dream of patricide and being seduced by old witches. The theory goes like this, that there's a form of the unconscious mind that is shared by all members of the same species, and that it originates in the inherited structure of our brains. Jung noticed how different cultures expressed stories, images, and symbols in similar forms and traditions. And he called the distillate of these similarities archetypes. Archetypes represent patterns of thoughts and behavior or basic psychological instincts that are common to humanity as a whole. In his own world travels, Jung collected myths and images to relate to his patients' dreams and to his own extensive and vivid visions. Everywhere he found evidence of the collective unconscious. Images, symbols, and behavior that had remarkable similarity to that of an individual's dreaming unconscious. This suggests that certain archetypes erupt from a common space of creativity, 
That space is the collective unconscious. Joseph Campbell is a scholar of comparative mythology who is very much in the same school of thought as Carl Jung. He is perhaps most famously known for his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, wherein Campbell outlines what he calls the monomyth, an archetype found in mythology and modern storytelling alike that outlines the stages that occur in almost every hero's journey. At a TEDx, Pat Solomon describes Joseph Campbell's monomyth. He explains that there are three basic parts to every journey, separation, initiation, and return, with many points punctuating these sections as the story transitions from beginning to end. This story structure is an archetype of the collective unconscious, in fact, and as far as archetypes go, it is an immensely popular and successful one. Think about some of your favorite stories and see for yourself whether they follow this formula. Beginning with the separation, where the hero gets pulled into an adventure, leaving the known limitations of their current world behind, and entering into a new world full of trials and the promise of an incredible reward. And then transitioning into an initiation, where the hero must overcome obstacles and temptations until they reach the final challenge in which they die to their old ordinary self and become reborn as heroes capable of overcoming their final obstacle. And then does it end with a return where the hero must leave the adventure behind, having conquered the ultimate foe and gaining the ultimate prize and return back to their original world. Having come full circle, only now they've transcended their limits and are master of their own fate earning the freedom to live fully. You see this general pattern occurring in stories such as Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, The Wizard of Oz, The Lion King, and a host of other stories, like Star Wars. In fact, George Lucas was close friends with Joseph Campbell and was well aware of the monomyth archetype when he wrote and directed his epic space opera series. In this interview with Bill Moyers, George Lucas talks about myth, Joseph Campbell, and making Star Wars. You see, he set out to write a children's film that was something like a modern fairy tale. He came across Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces and was inspired to write the story we know so well today. See how the monomyth shaped these films and the various archetypes employed therein. You have the call to adventure, the wise old man, the refusal of the call, the acceptance of the call. You have the helper, the crossing of the threshold, and then the initiation process of trials, and the death of the mentor, and the magical flight, and the return, and the ultimate boon. These archetypes play out in small variations in each movie and in an overarching sense, spanning the entire series. We see more mentors, more trials, more deaths of father types, more rewards, and more returns. I guess ultimately what I'm saying here is that I believe it's our right to use archetypes in storytelling. In fact, I think it's an intrinsic part of our culture as human beings. And if George Lucas and so many others can borrow from myths and from the structure of myths, then why not we? If these elements are inherent to our species, as Jung and Campbell propose, then why shouldn't we use them? Now, that's not the same as saying we should be writing stories about mistreated young boys who live under staircase and become wizards. That would be blatant theft. What I'm talking about is using the motifs that underpin such stories and using them in your own unique way to forge your own myths. Because what's a myth if not a story that attempts to explain the richness of our human experience using the most resounding symbols available? Because we are members of the human race and the human race is filled with passion.